Okay, let's be real. Nobody wants to waste their time or their breath on a prayer life that makes no change in the world around them, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Prayer is supposed to bring change into our environment. Well, I'm with you, and I got sick and tired of wasting my time on prayers that were not fruitful and not effective, especially when Jesus' example was so different than what I was experiencing, and especially when the Word says my prayers are powerful and effective. So I went on a journey and asked the Lord to teach me how to pray. Little did I know, the disciples prayed the same thing in Luke 11.1. 1. So today I'm going to teach you what the Lord taught me about how to have fruitful, effective prayer. And I believe this could very well change your life. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenilee Samuel. Okay, so before I jump in, I wanted to do a couple of shout outs. You guys are so great about leaving reviews online and they touch my heart so much. So I thought I would actually um, read a couple of them. This one is from A Taylor 100. I think that's Anthony. Uh, and he says with five star rating, generally is very wise and knowledgeable, can tell she comes from a place of wanting to encourage, empower and equip her listeners. Give an episode a listen. I love that. Thank you, Anthony. That's such a compliment. Um, and then SK Butler says championing change. That's the episode they listened to. And that was from quite a few, that was almost a year back with, uh, Bria Jones. And she says, absolutely love the safe space that was cultivated in this episode. Very eye opening and educational about the racial divide in our country and how we can move forward. I love that. And there was actually quite a few people that commented on that episode, um, about racism. And that was just a blessing. Like that was just honestly very humbling to hear their feedback and we have a solid five-star review on iTunes you guys and that is such a blessing because believe it or not it actually helps our uh, my podcast come up higher in search results when there's a high rating and so if you haven't gone on iTunes or wherever you listen to rate and review the podcast would you consider doing that it's huge it's super encouraging to me, Um, but it also really helps the algorithm get our episodes out to more people. So it's a simple way that you can help share the podcast. So just wanted to say that. And then also a shout out to my newest monthly sponsor, Melody. Uh, Melody, thank you so much for signing up to support the podcast. You're such a blessing. When I reached out to her to tell her thank you, she said, you know, I figured if I can pay a monthly subscription to read my favorite books, I could pay a monthly subscription to support my favorite podcast. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, I love that. So just wanted to say those shout outs, you guys. Now let's jump into this episode on prayer. Love y'all. You guys may be able to hear, I'm sitting here by the fire. You'll probably hear the firewood crackling a little bit, but it just is the perfect place to sit and talk about prayer. Okay, so let me tell y'all a story. You may have heard this before if you've known me for a while, but I did not used to love prayer when, well, not that I ever hated it, but the way people would talk about it sounded so like awful. And I did hate when I was younger that I would, it felt like I'd pray and pray and pray and pray forever and not see things happen. Every now and again I did, so it felt like a lucky win, you know, but it always felt like such a huge guessing game. And then to hear people talk about it, I was at Bible school and we had a speaker come in and talk about intercession and just even the word intercession sounds so intense and heavy. And she would use language like, I travailed in, in groans for two hours. And I was like, oh God, that sounds like torture. Like who wants to do this? <laughs> and so I went and sat down with the Lord and I said, Lord, listen, reality is prayer does not sound like much fun. I don't know how to get any answers. I really, I don't feel like I have a good prayer life. And clearly it's important to you because it's important in scripture. So please teach me how to like praying. And from there, the Lord told me, he actually said, okay, generally, here's what you need to do. He said, I want you to pray 20 minutes a day. He said, it doesn't sound like much, but it's going to change your life. And so I was like, well, all right, I could do 20 minutes a day. I mean, like that's doable, right? So 
every night I'd spend, and there were some nights, of course, I would like climb in bed and be ready to fall asleep and I'd forgotten my 20 minutes. I was like, no. So I'd get up and do my 20 minutes. And there was many times that I fell asleep on my face on the floor because it was late and I was tired. <laughs> but in the process, the Lord did teach me how to love prayer because he taught me a different approach. And so what I did is I would, the first few nights, of course, I'd prayed out all my all of my wish list and prayers and whatever. And by the third night, I was out of stuff to pray for. And I was like, okay, Lord, I've got 20 minutes and I don't know what else to pray. So give me some ideas here. And so that's really when it began to shift. And the Lord, I would wait on the Lord and he would just bring an idea, a really subtle, like almost like when you're sitting there just thinking about nothing and just something flits across your mind. It was like that real subtle. And someone would come across my mind and I started to recognize it was the Lord because these are people that I wouldn't maybe regularly think about or people I didn't know very well. So when I finally started to realize, oh, maybe that's the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, so-and-so, I don't know them very well. I don't know what's going on in their life. Is there something specific I should be praying? And then I would wait until I got like an impression or, or heard maybe like pray for their finances or something. And so I would kind of just in quietness lean into that, little, little bit of guidance that he would give me. And I would just kind of lean into it. And the more I did it every day, the more sensitive I would become and the, the more I begin to see, but I just went with what I, what I saw or sensed. And so I would just, you know, pray for their finances. And I, I was like, well, I don't know what's wrong with their finances. So I'll just pray scripture. Or I would, if I didn't know, I would literally just ask the Lord to kind of fill me in. I'd be like, give me a little insight. And he would do that. And so the next day I'd see that person running around campus and I'd be like, Hey, um, I know we don't know each other very well, but I was praying for you last night and this is what I was praying for. And sure enough, they'd be like, Oh my gosh, that's what I'm dealing with. Thank you so much. And so that began my journey of a, what felt like actually effective prayer, because if nothing else, I knew I was hearing from God. So that just in itself felt more effective. And then B, it began to develop my hearing of the Lord's voice. I know I've shared this with you guys before, um, but it really began to teach me like prayer doesn't have to be long, tedious, wordy, drama. It doesn't have to be exhausting to be effective. It just needs to be from the heart of God. And so I began to look through scripture and see what God's example of prayer was. Now, I think what a lot of people do is, is we think we have to go on and on forever, like that it's holier that I spend an hour in prayer than five minutes. But truth be told, y'all, I don't frequently spend a whole hour in prayer, but I do pray all day long because my mind and my thoughts constantly go to the Lord and I'm constantly praying off the things that come up in my heart. I'm constantly asking the Lord, how would you like me to pray about this? And so I believe that short um, targeted prayer can be even more effective than long windy prayer. In fact, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6, and he, he's about to give the example of how we should pray, and he says, do not babble on and on like the pagans who think that they're heard for their many words, but this is how you should pray, and then he goes through the Lord's Prayer, but I find it interesting, he says, don't babble on and on, like he's making the point, prayer should not be hard, exhausted, and blah, 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 I mean, there's a moment, there's moments and situations where more prayer is needed for a situation, um, and there are times when consistent, diligent, faithful prayer over time is what a situation requires. But I really have come to learn that it's not more effective and it's not more fruitful necessarily to just go on and on and on. In fact, Jesus' example in Luke 11, uh, let me pull that up here. In Luke 11, where Jesus is telling us how to pray, he, he doesn't go on and on. In fact, he just prays one-liners. And that kind of got my attention. Listen, this is what he says. He says to the disciples, because um, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He says, when you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. In other words, acknowledge his sovereignty. Your kingdom come. That sets the stage for our prayer life, right? Your kingdom, not my wishes, but your wishes. Your kingdom come on earth. And then give us each day our daily bread. Please feed me spiritually. Tell me what I need to know for that day. Forgive our sins. And we will also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Y'all literally, that's like two sentences. 
and he covered all the things and everything was like a few words or less. Like long, tedious prayers are not necessarily the goal. I have found that the prayers that are the most effective are prayers that come straight from the heart of God. The Bible says in James 5, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. Listen, if you don't feel like your prayers are powerful and effective, that's okay. That's why we're having this episode because they can be. They can be powerful and effective. Mark eleven twenty four says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you've received it and it will be yours. Now, when there's language like that, that's so confident and so black and white, it makes me realize, holy cow, I need to take a lot more confidence into my prayer life. Okay, now one thing I want us to note from the way that Jesus shows us to pray is that the Lord's prayer is all built around God, not around me. And so it's Father, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. You give me what I need. You forgive my sins and I'll forgive others. And you lead me not into temptation. So what I see in all of that is a constant positioning of humility that God is God and we know he's the source and he, which of course that's what prayer is about. But it is, I have heard believers go into prayer and be like, God, you just need to bring them to their very bottom so that they'll realize their sin. And I've, I've just, I've heard prayers that are really not built around the sovereignty of God <laughs> that maybe are built more around judgment or accusation or even fear. God, please, please help us not. Ugh. There's moments when prayers can be pleading. There's moments when prayers can be just crying out. There, there's scripturally, there are places for that. But in general, Jesus' example here anyways, is a confident, assertive, get it done kind of approach to prayer. Jesus is like, Lord, you're holy. You're God. I acknowledge who you are. Here's the deal. We want your kingdom here. So let's get it there. So now from that position... If we want God's kingdom to be established on earth, which is what prayer is for, prayer is like, like if there was a, okay, this is a lame example, but it's the one that's coming to mind. Let's pretend there's a slide between heaven and earth, and we're trying to get the things of earth to slide down, or the things of heaven to slide down into the earth. Prayer is the slide. It's the means of God getting involved in the earth. He put us in the earth and gave us dominion in the earth. When Jesus came, it says he took back the keys of death and um, from hell and the grave, and he, he bought them back. And so God left us, as the word also says, we are little gods in the earth, meaning we have a divine nature, and we are to function as God would function in this earth. And so <clears throat> when Jesus was here, he established authority. He established righteousness. He established his kingdom. And that's our position. Well, that is, prayer is our vehicle to do that. Prayer, our words, actually, um, like when God spoke the world into existence, he saw in his heart and mind what he wanted to create, and then he opened his mouth to create it. We're made in God's image, and when God puts in our heart and mind what he wants to do in the earth, we have a responsibility to open our mouth to see it created. And that is how I view prayer. I realize I have a mandate. I am a, what's the word? Like someone who represents a country in another nation, an ambassador. I'm an ambassador. I am the conduit that God has chosen to use to bring his kingdom into this earth. I am a son of God. This earth is my responsibility and my family, my job, my territory. When I pray for America, I don't pray like it's this big overwhelming thing I can't impact. I pray from a place of ownership. God, this is my America and this cannot be happening in my America. And you have put me here as a gatekeeper over America. And so you tell me exactly how to pray and I will pray your will. That's how I pray. That's how I pray over my family. That's how I pray over my friends. The Bible also says, uh, oh, that was in Matthew 6, 7 that said, don't babble on like pagans. Um, let's see. Psalms 82 is where he says, you are gods and sons of the most high. Oh, shoot. Where'd that verse go that says, 
Well, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you received it and it will be yours. There's another passage that says, ask anything according to my will and you will have it. And this is the key that I build my prayer life around. I was telling a Bible study the other night, the number one most popular thing that I pray, the number one thing is, Lord, how should I pray about this? That's my most popular prayer. Lord, how should I pray about this? And then I wait and I listen. And when he tells me how to pray about this, that's how I pray. And you know what? I don't have to spend a lot of time praying when I do that because God doesn't waste words. And so neither will I. But when I know I'm praying exactly what his desires are, then I realize that it's not me wishing and willing and and trying to twist his arm to make something happen. When God tells me this is my will, I know that when I open my mouth to pray it, I am aligning with the authority of God and his destiny over that situation, the destiny that he set in order. I am bringing my voice in total alignment with his will. And so when I pray from that place, nothing is in the way. I, I, and if the Lord will tell me, you know, if there's spiritual barriers or things I need to deal with, or oftentimes, in fact, that brings me to another point. Repentance is an important aspect of this. A lot of times we can go into a situation and just start praying the righteousness of God into a situation. But what we don't realize is when it's a situation where the enemy is stealing or the enemy is at work, sometimes the enemy's at work because he's been given um, legal access is what we call it. Permission, basically. If I'm sinning, if I am, or if, if, if someone is looking at pornography in private, they are engaging in sin, and that opens the door for the enemy to be at work in their life. It gives permission because the, the wall is down. They have breached the wall of, of righteousness. The Bible says that the righteous man's prayers are powerful and effective. And so that's not to say if something's taken a long time, there must be sin in your life. That's just to say that if we're not walking intentionally in righteousness... We can't expect our prayers to be as effective. Sometimes we have to break the power of the enemy in a situation through repentance. And so when I pray over America, if there's a problem, if there's a wickedness issue, if there's an evil issue, if there's corruption, I will go into repentance first for that sin. Jesus did it on the cross when he said, Father, forgive these people for they know not what they do. He prayed a repentance prayer over them because repentance is how we cover the situation with, the, with God's grace and how we remove the enemy's access. And then from there, we can release the kingdom of God. In fact, when in Luke, where Jesus is giving us the example of how to pray, it acknowledges the Father. He says, I want your kingdom to come. So he's like, speak to me your kingdom. Give me what I need, this daily bread. And then it goes into forgiveness. Forgive our sins and I'll forgive those who sin sin against me as well. Repentance is necessary. Not just repentance on behalf of the situation, but repentance of sin in my own life. Repentance of sin against somebody. And then I have to tend to that relationship as well. So forgiveness is a really important aspect of keeping a healthy prayer life. Forgiveness and repentance, both. And so being quick to repent to the Lord, be quick, being quick to repent to people, and, um, and then being quick to forgive, this gives you a healthy foundation to build your prayer life on. And this is something that I think that I do on a daily basis. Anytime I feel convicted of sin, I just repent right away. I just repent. I just deal with it. That way I don't live with sin hanging over my head, and, and I don't want to continue walking in sin intentionally. Once I'm aware of it, I'm going to get rid of it, right? Okay, so effective prayer, A, walks in through humility and awareness of like a God lens. God is who this is about. God's will is what this is about. I am a vehicle to establish the kingdom of God in this earth. I've been given authority. And so in humility, I come under the authority of Christ, acknowledge that he is God and I am not, but that I have his, his authority has been extended to me. Sorry, I'm tripping on my words. His authority has been extended to me. So I acknowledge his authority and then I step into my authority as a son of God. Secondly, many words are not necessary. God does not waste words. I will not waste words. Actually, 
I'm a verbal processor. I do waste words and I'm working on it. Forgive me. <laughs> um, thirdly, your righteous life is important. The prayers of a righteous person are effective. So continually keeping your heart soft and available to the Lord, if he should bring a conviction, hey, you spoke really harshly to your kids. You need to deal with that. Or, hey, you had a really bad attitude yesterday. Or, Jen, you're harboring unforgiveness or whatever. Deal with the issues as soon as they come up. Keep a clean heart. This is one of the most foundation things that will keep things powerful in your prayer life. And then lastly, the final, the clincher step or clincher principle that I have found is pray God's will. Pray God's will. If you want your prayers to be effective, find out what God wants to happen in the situation. Why would we waste our breath and waste our time praying from our own perspective when we could simply get quiet, find out his perspective, and pray that? And then, A, the results of your prayers are going to be far more effective, and you won't have wasted any time. An example of this is when we had a couple of friends who came down with coronavirus. I have learned that it's I don't want to be hasty going into things and just praying on assumption. Now, some things we just see in the word of God. Hey, God has a will here and I have a right to pray for healing or whatever. And I think I always have a right to pray for healing. But in this situation, I didn't want to be presumptuous. And I said, Lord, how do I need to pray about this? And the gentleman, the Lord told me that he was going to choose to go home with the father. And then the woman, the Lord told me it was not her time to die. She would be fine. And so I prayed in agreement with that. So with the first, the guy, I felt that he was going to go home with the Lord. But even still, of course, I, I pray for healing because I, I want to be in agreement with, with what his family is praying and all this kind of stuff. And healing is still in alignment with God's will. It's not like it's against God's will. But I knew in my heart that he was going to go home to be with the Lord. And so I just also prayed over the family that they, their hearts would be prepared for what comes. Um, and there was a, I feel like there was another, oh yeah, there was another situation recently where my husband's laptop was stolen. He was in Houston with our pastor and they were having lunch and someone busted the window in my pastor's truck and stole my husband's laptop bag uh, with his laptop, his gun, and his checkbooks. And I was like, okay. Now this is another type of prayer that I have learned that is also very effective. The enemy is not allowed to steal from me. The stuff that belongs to us belongs to us, and he doesn't have a right to take it. And so in prayer, I don't let the enemy get away with that stuff. And so I said, okay, Lord, the enemy thinks he's going to steal from us and cause havoc. I don't think so. And so I said, Lord, you make the enemy pay back. He stole what is ours. That belongs to us. And this is a passage in the Old Testament that I model this style of prayer after. And the Bible, the Bible says, um, I think it's in Deuteronomy. I can never remember where it is, but I think it's in Deuteronomy. It says, it talks about the just judge. It says, if a thief is caught stealing, you must bring him before the just judge. And the original Hebrew, that just judge is, is referring to God. And then you must say, that belongs to me. And then the just judge will find the thief guilty and make him pay back twofold what he has stolen. You guys, every time I've prayed to the Lord as my just judge, I have seen powerful, powerful responses, fast responses to prayer. Because why? The judge has already decreed it. In a, in a court of law, if the judge says he is guilty, then everyone else's job in the room is to enact what the judge just said. The, the, um, the warden has to put the guy in cuffs, take him to jail. The jury um, has already done their job, has already released their decision, and the judge is the one who decrees it. And so once the judge decrees it, everything in the courtroom moves to make it happen. Well, that's the same thing that I feel like happens in prayer. God is a just judge. What he decrees what he has written about your life before the foundations of the world and written in the books of your life, the things that he has decreed over you, the things he's decreed over me, the things that God has said over a situation, once we know what the judge has said and what he has decreed, our job is to come into agreement and to push that thing forward. And so that's what I do. So my husband's laptop bag was stolen. 
So I said, Lord, you make the enemy pay back twofold. He stole from us and that's not right. And so I said, I call that blessing into our home. Literally, uh, let's see, it was like Monday they were in Houston. I guess Wednesday, the Lord prompted a gentleman at church and Sunday he brought a check to my husband. Now the church had already offered to replace my husband's laptop. So we already knew it was gonna be replaced. But on top of that, twofold, right? A man at church said, the Lord spoke to me on Wednesday and told me to pay for your laptop. Here's a check for $2,500. Twofold, guys. The Lord replaced my husband's laptop through the church and through a gentleman. Twofold. And so when I'm like, and it doesn't surprise me anymore. People come to me all the time. They're like, hey, listen, I want to meet. I'm ready to get married. So will you pray for me to find my future spouse? And I look at them. I said, listen, are you actually ready? Because when I pray, the Lord brings a spouse. And they're like, yes. I'm like, okay, then I'm going to begin praying. And I ask them, what are you believing for? How can I pray in agreement with you? And then I begin calling that spouse into their life. Literally, I've prayed in probably a dozen spouses. It's crazy and exciting and fun. (laughs) I feel like a spiritual matchmaker. Um, But anyways, so the point, that last point being, What makes your prayers the most powerful and effective aside from coming in with the right posture of humility, laying a healthy foundation of a righteous life and a a forgiving, repentant heart is you need to know what God is saying in the situation. If you know what God is saying in the situation, it's already been decided. Once the judge has released a decree, it's already decided. Everything just has to go into motion to make it happen. And so my number one prayer when I'm praying is, God, how do I pray about this? And I'm telling you, since I adopted that habit of hearing the Father's heart on a situation before I just launch into reckless prayer, when I hear God's heart on a situation and pray in that place, my prayers are so very effective. And because now I have a track record of effective, fruitful, powerful prayer, It boosts my faith and boosts my confidence. And so now when I pray, I know God hears me. I know God is going to answer me. I know he is. He has proven that so many times. And I know it because of the word of God. So this is a simple episode. It's short, but there's those four little key things that I have learned that I that have created a really fruitful prayer prayer life for me. The first one is your posture of humility, acknowledging God is God. Um, and, and then in that humility, you're acknowledging also your godship and your um, authority in this earth, the authority that he's gave, given you as a son of God. Many words is not necessary. Keep it brief. Okay. And then the foundation of a righteous life and walking in forgiveness and repentance. That's your foundation you're building on is repentance, right? Repentance and, and, uh, and righteousness. And then lastly is find out what God says in the situation because we're establishing God's kingdom in the earth. You've got to know what's going on in God's kingdom so you can establish it in the earth. That is the mission of your prayer life. It's not to pray for hours. It's not to pray recklessly. Now, don't get me wrong. If you feel like God's not saying anything, then pray according to scripture. Pray what you see in the word of God. Ooh, that, that brings me to another bonus point. Another thing that will make your prayers very effective is praying, and well, this goes along with that last one, praying the word of God over situations. If you don't know what to pray, if you're still learning how to hear God's voice, that's okay. Go to the word and just Google, what are scriptures about financial problems? Like if your finances are tight, find scriptures and pray those scriptures over your finances until it changes your thinking and changes your speech and it'll change your reality. And the reason why this is effective is because the word also says that angels hearken unto the voice of God, unto the voice of the word. Angels do not respond to reckless language. They respond to the word of God. God is their commander. The voice of God is their commanding voice of authority. That is what they respond to. So if you want angels to be activated on your behalf, you want angels to respond to your prayers, then you need to speak the word of God over situations. That is the highest um, authority in a situation is the word of God. And especially when God has spoken to you, hey, this is the word that I want you to release over the situation. And so 
I hope this helps laying a, a good foundation, going in with humility, acknowledging God is God. And I am a son of God in the earth. And I have a right to speak and release his kingdom into the situation. Um, many words is not necessary. Keep your words few. Pray what God is saying and pray that alone. Jesus gave us that example with his life. You're building on a foundation of a righteous life that is quick to repent, quick to apologize to people, quick to forgive. That is your foundation that keeps your prayers honestly pure and powerful. And then pray according to God's will. Pray what God would say, and that's how you establish the kingdom of God in your situation. All right, I'm going to take you into life hacks where I share a little practical thing that I do that is how I pray for a lot of people without spending a whole lot of time. And again, I'm not all about shortcuts necessarily. I am about smarter, not harder. (laughs) And so this life hack will ramp your prayer life and ramp your ability to minister to people and see God move in their life but it's so simple. So thanks guys for listening. Share this episode. I hope it was um, helpful to you. I hope it was encouraging. And otherwise, don't forget to rate and review online. And I'll be reading these in the future and, and calling out those reviews because they're such a blessing. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. So one thing that I do that actually makes prayer easier um, to do and be praying for a lot of people in my life is I will sit down just once. You only really have to do it once unless you want to go back and tweak it. But I sat down and, and on a piece of paper wrote one through 30 for every day of the month. And then I prayed and asked the Lord like, hey, who are some people you want me to be praying for consistently? And so I just started writing down names. They can be family. They can be friends. They can be I mean, coworkers, anybody. And then I went into my calendar and every single day recurring on a monthly basis, I put that person's name on um, a day of the month. And so I actually every day have people scheduled that I pray for. And then when that day comes up and I see that on my calendar... And I'm not going to lie, I'm not perfect. I I do forget to do it some days. But when I do notice it and I make the point, it has been very fruitful. And so last week, for example, I had a couple on there that my husband and I have mentored for years. And so I just reached out and said, hey, you guys are on my prayer calendar for today. Is there anything I can be praying about? And they both responded with some specific requests. And so I just responded back with a written prayer for both of them. And they were like, thank you so much. Well, she messaged me like two days later and she was like, oh my gosh, God started acting on your prayers even that day. And she said, these are some of the breakthroughs we've seen. She was like, seen some breakthrough in our relationship, seen some breakthrough with the baby and a job came available. And those were some things she had asked prayer for. And I was like, well, my goodness. And you guys, all I did was put her in my calendar, her and him, and they rotate around every month. And so this is great for people that you'd like to establish more of a connection with or that you have a connection but you'd like to take it a little deeper anyways and honestly nobody ever refuses to be prayed for like people want to be prayed for and so I find that most times when I take the time to stop and pray for someone they're so touched by it because it just conveys so much value for them and it kind of brings them in remembrance that God sees their life and that they matter especially when they see him then move in their life. So that's a little life hack that my husband and I have adopted. It's actually part of our process um, that we use to uh, make disciples. And meaning that we it's part of our journey that we take people on um, to develop a spiritual relationship with people and begin to pour into their life and whatever, whatever. But that's one aspect of it. And it is a really great way to simplify your prayer life and make it way more doable. And y'all, it takes literally three minutes. Prayer does not have to be long. As I said in the episode, prayer does not have to be long to be effective. It just needs to be intentional. So there's your life hack. I hope that can uh, be a little way that you zhuzh up your prayer life. And if you do that, let me know. Would you send me a message or um, throw this episode up on your stories on Instagram or Facebook and tag me and let me know if you're going to be doing that prayer challenge. I would love to hear you guys doing that and hear how it's changing your life and the lives of the people around you. Thanks you guys for listening. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend and I will see you next week. Love y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. 
For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. Reading your comments and reviews always means so much to me. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say hey. It's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Thank you to each of you for your ongoing support. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Until next time, remember, you've got this and God's got you.